Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Richard Dion. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this IGF Connex Support Unit sponsored webinar on technology trends and implications in mining, a law and policy perspective. This is the first of two webinars on the role of technology in mining. The next one is scheduled for early June. I'm very pleased to have an outstanding group of individuals to discuss the topic. Our webinar today will be broken down into two parts, speaker remarks, and then we will have a panel discussion. We've invited our speakers to reflect on the possible implications of future trends and technologies, as well as how concretely these technologies can unfold and what are the appropriate responses to them. We will also address the fiscal, socioeconomic, and regulatory issues. Very quickly about myself, my name is Richard Dion and I work at the Connex Support Unit, a G7 initiative which provides governments with short-term multidisciplinary assistance in contract negotiations. Connex provides assistance in legal, technical, financial, and environmental support in three sectors, mining, mining that infrastructure, and renewable energy. We also have Isabella Ramdu with us today. She's the deputy director of the IGF since 2018. Previous posts have included the African Minerals Development Center, as well as the European Center for Development Policy Management. Joining us as well from IGF is Thomas Le Thomas Lassour, who is a senior policy analyst in the tax and extractive section at the IGF. He was formerly a senior economic analyst at the Natural Resource Governance Institute. What I would like to do now is request that Isabel take the floor to frame a little bit about IGS work around taxation. Isabella, over to you. Thank you, Richard. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Good evening for those who are on the other side of the world. Thanks so much, Richard, for the introduction. And uh, just for those of you who do not know IGF, we are an intergovernmental forum focusing on mining and metals with a membership of 77 countries. Our aim is to support governments in leveraging their mineral resources for sustainable development and mitigate their negative impacts. Thanks for joining our conversation. We are very pleased to be hosting this with Conex and um, we really look forward to the conversation. As Richard mentioned, we will be talking about new technologies in the mining sector and what impacts, uh, what impacts those sweeping changes will have for the regulatory and uh, uh, policy uh, frameworks. Um, the next uh, part of that conversation will happen in June and we will focus on community relations. So uh, please keep that in mind. And just before uh, Richard and our speakers dive into the meat of the discussion, I just wanted to provide some uh, quick framing to our conversation. I'm just gonna share my screen with you. So in the last few years, IGF has, has been looking at the trends in new technologies and what those could mean for policymakers. Last year, we conducted a technology impact review, and this year we're looking at policy implications and, policy and possible responses. We will be releasing a report at the end of June to look at those implications, so stay tuned for that one. Um, just first, let us uh, a little bit look at what technological trends are coming and, um, and what does that mean for the mining sector. The fourth industrial revolution is impacting uh, every aspect of our lives and every economic sectors. The changes that are being adopted in the mining sector include a suite of very different technologies. Our technological impact review came up with a simplified um, taxonomy of technologies, as, uh, as you can see on the screen, that we classified in four baskets. Two of them are around the use of big data and artificial intelligence. We distinguish between technologies that use and produce data, such as data analytics, automated machines, and those are critical for mine operations, and with technologies that use standardized processes to transfer data safely through networks, including things like smart contracts, secured payments, etc. Those are critical for operations and supply chains. Then we have enablers of digitization. Those technologies provide an interface between human intelligence and artificial intelligence to improve efficiency and productivity of labor and operations. Examples include sensors, connected wearables, drones, etc. And finally, we have process improvers, which are meant to make mines safer, cleaner, and greener. Those include um, electric vehicles, water management technologies, renewables, et cetera. 
The last World Economic Forum report on the future of jobs confirmed that 90% of companies surveyed are focusing on the adoption of three technologies, namely hardware and robotic process automation, digitization and connected wearables, and big data analytics. That kind of confirms what we saw last year when we conducted the tech survey. And COVID-19 has been an accelerator of some technologies given the need to keep people safe and organize remote working. So quickly, what impacts will those changes have? First, we need to recognize that the magnitude of impact is very difficult to measure. We are looking at a suit of very different innovations and applications, each of which will have different types of impacts depending on countries, on my locations and on stakeholders engaged. That said, impacts can be seen at three levels. First, for the mining industry, the whole point is to overcome increasing geological challenges and improve productivity and asset efficiency. Also, a key issue is the safety of mining operations and mine workers. Secondly, for local communities, Often mining is the sole, if not the largest employer and business partner of mining communities. Some technologies such as automation can displace local jobs with ripple effects on local economies. In the absence of other alternatives, implications for those communities can be disastrous. On the other hand, technologies can provide new opportunities for example, internet access and access to energy can support new economic activities. And overall impact will depend on how transitions are anticipated and managed. And finally, for governments, national level socioeconomic benefits through taxation, local content and economic spillovers are core expectations that can be impacted in a way or another with changes brought in by new technologies. What implication then for the deal between the state and the mine investor? And how will that balance be restored? So the last few obs observations I wanted to make is, and this is a segue to the next part of our discussion, are then to ask what implications those changes will have for law and policy. Are we moving towards a new re regulatory paradigm? So law and policy may be impacted by technological change changing at least two ways. First, the development and use of new technologies require significant investments in research and development and innovation, for example. Not all of those will be done in countries, but they require good in-country regulations that may not exist at this point. The question therefore is, what is missing and what new laws and policies are needed? Coming to mind are increasing in intangible assets, in increasing use of intangible assets and intellectual property rights, data protection, digital privacy, cybersecurity, et cetera. Also, we might see new firms like tech companies or battery companies taking stakes in mining operations. Are mining policies and frameworks adapted to deal with such companies? Another issue is that disruptive technologies are crossing traditional industry boundaries. Example, Drones fall under the purview of different regulators, such as aviation and telecommunications, which are sometimes not consistent and coordinated. Are legal frameworks equipped for the sharing economy? And there are other more complex issues related to interconnectedness of technologies, use and services, which may lead to shifting liabilities in case of harms, harm and litigation. For example, who is liable in case of an automated truck get involved in a road accident since there's no driver? The software company, the truck manufacturer, the controllers? What is needed in the legal framework to address those? And finally, and I will stop here, the second way that law, policy, law and policy can be affected is that new technologies may impact on the enforcement of current policies and regulation. Questions that come to mind are, are mining codes and legal frameworks still fit for purpose? Will current forms of local content policies still deliver on their expectations? What does that mean for the future of resource taxation? Are mining contracts future-proof? So those are a, a, a few questions and a few food for thought, and I really look forward to hearing from our panelists on those questions. And with that, Richard, I'd hand, hand it back to you. 
Isabel, thanks very much. It's absolutely fascinating. It was almost smiling as you're discussing. Uh, a lot of the time, we might not have all the answers today, but some of the questions that you raised are, of course, very, uh, very important. And I think that over just a few look over the last 12 or 18 months, how technology has played a role in society. Um, perhaps we're heading uh, we're heading in that direction with regards to mining. Uh, what I would like to do is hand is now hand over to to Thomas, who will speak a little bit more with regards to to uh, to these implications and the future of uh, resource taxation. Thomas, if you could take it away, please. Um, thanks a lot, Richard, and thanks a lot, Isabel, for this um, this framing. Um, indeed, we we. Um, it sounds like at this moment we we mostly have questions and and very few answers. So it's it's good that we have these discussions and we can hear from different perspectives and try to come up with um, with answers to the problems that are uh, that are coming. So I will I will take it over from there and focus more on the um, likely impacts on on taxation from uh, changes in in technology. Um, but then our panelists will you know, broaden discussion to other aspects of the legal and regulatory framework as well. So. Um, as I said, you know, a lot of you, it's a little bit speculative at this stage because we don't yet know, you know, how exactly how the what the future will look like, what technologies will dominate, but we can start to think about um, some possible futures. So what I would like to do to kickstart the discussion is to share three trends that I think are likely to emerge from uh, the adoption of new technology in mining um, and that have an impact on, on on taxation and revenue generation for governments, and then I'll venture into suggesting three areas of, of possible government actions. So the, the three trends uh, I think are worth highlighting um, are first the, 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 the fact that employment uh, in mines will change with the adoption of, of, of new technology. Uh, secondly, the increasing role of in, intangible assets. And three, the appearance of new business models. So if I start with the first one, um, it's, it's likely that some of these new technologies are likely to replace significant numbers of low and medium skilled workers in the countries where they are deployed. Now, it's possible that new forms of employment will be created in these countries, but it will definitely have an impact on the type of workers that are hired, uh, where they are based and what they consumed, meaning the types of taxes that are collected from the direct employment impact, but also indirect employment impact, maybe even more so, uh, will be important. So the think about, um, for, I mean, when I talk about indirect impact, think about mine workers, low skill mine workers, typically live close to the mines, maybe are from these areas, they're gonna use their salaries in the same, in the areas where they're based, meaning uh, impact on hospitality, housing, services, et cetera, which then pay taxes on, on, on governments. If you have a different types of workers, if they are based differently, they might not have the same consumption pattern. And therefore, the types of taxes generated by the indirect uh, activity linked to these uh, salaries will also be different. Um, and this could be why, I mean, the, some of the numbers we have on, um, on, 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 on labor taxes for mining uh, are quite important in according to a number of EITI reports. In some countries, as, as high as 20% um, or more of, of, of revenues related to the to the mining sector. Secondly, the, the increasing growth of new technologies will lead to, um, more, to, ha, to, ha, to more use of, of, um, of mining-related intangible assets, such as patents, uh, algorithms, et cetera, um, at different stages of the mining, uh, the mining value chain. So intangible assets in terms of, uh, from the perspective of tax authorities, uh, when auditing mining companies and, and other companies in other sectors, intangible assets are really um, a difficult area and often represent a major risk of profit shifting by multinational companies who own you know, uh, intangible assets and that the, they can be located in, in low tax jurisdiction. So if this if there's a higher use of intangible assets, that's, that's might make the jobs of tax authorities even harder and increase the opportunities for uh, for profit shifting uh, in sort of this this area. The third trend that also is, is worth highlighting and maybe even more speculative than the other two um, is how new technologies may lead to changes in mining business models. Um, so the traditional roles and relationship between mining companies and the customers, their suppliers, their shareholders might might change with the with the changes in, in business model, linked to the higher use of um, 
of technology and who provides the technology. And you know, think about mines that then can be uh, almost entirely operated by control room overseas. It doesn't require the same set of skills, uh, might not be the same set of actors. The, the structure of multinational companies might change as well. And so from the perspective of tax authorities that also create uh, more complexity, uh, more risks into how they audit these taxpayers uh, and how international tax rules apply to this changing sort of corporate uh, corporate models. Um, so very briefly, these were the three three trends I think that are that are important to keep in mind and and that might be very relevant for for tax authority uh, in in resource rich countries. Then I mentioned three areas for possible government action uh, linked to, to the increasing adoption of, of new technology in mining. Um, first, there is actually an opportunity of drastic improvements in tax administration. Uh, second, the, um, there are discussions around the revision of how capital is taxed versus how labor is taxed. And third, they, there's also a bit of a creativity in terms of, of mining taxation models that can be spurred by, uh, by this changing uh, landscape. First, um, I'm talking about an opportunity which is probably larger than mining, but if you focus on the mining sector, uh, new technologies may also mean opportunities for government uh, administration to, uh, to improve its oversight of the mining sector. If mining operations are, are digitalized and create a lot of um, real-time data, this means the data is potentially also available to government agencies to have a, um, a more accurate monitoring of the mining production, of, mine, of the sale of minerals abroad, uh, and can give new tools for tax administration to, um, to monitor the transactions between, between different subsidiaries of mining companies. So that requires a large investment in government capacity, not just human capacity, but also you know, technical, big servers, uh, you know, fast speed uh, connections. But if that investment is made, it could, re it could really improve the way that um, the tax administration and, and some of the mining, um, mining regulatory agencies in charge of, of controlling the sector could operate with opportunities on, um, on mining taxation and maybe on the opportunity to, to adjust the mining fiscal regime uh, according to this new, new data. Second, um, there's, there are discussions around the, how rules uh, on labor, the taxation of labor and taxation of capital uh, actually incentivize a more rapid transition towards automation that might be uh, good from a societal perspective. And so some experts argue that because the taxation of capital is more, um, is more, it's not as, is, is lower than the taxation of labor. Um, think about the number of accelerated depreciation uh, incentives on, on, on capital investments, um, some, how some countries don't tax capital gains um, versus how high labor taxes are in general, because traditionally it has been easier to collect than tax on capital and they haven't and they've haven't distorted investment the same way. But when you know robots are not part of labor but part of capital investments and there is tend to replace workers in a number of areas, um, there is a discussion to be had about trying to change some of these rules to make it uh, to make the, the the playing field a bit easier for workers and maybe to to slow down the pace of automation to give societies the time to adjust. Um, and that's that's a broader discussion than just mining, but it's, it's also on the table. And and to, to, be, to put it simple, some people call it taxing robots, uh, but it's, it's more about capital versus labor taxes. And third, um, in terms of what government can do and maybe ha are starting to do, um, so these drastic changes in how uh, mining is done or mining will be done in, in the future, may lead to new forms of revenue collection mechanisms. And here, I mean, a lot can happen. Uh, it's hard to say today exactly where, where things will are going, but and there's also likely to be a diversity in what governments how governments react to to the way um, benefit sharing models change in the mining sector. So on the one hand, you're starting to see you know change on, on an international level. I mean the the number of reforms led by the the OECD and the inclusion framework of of 130 countries to reform international taxation. Um, is the momentum came from the rise of the digitalization of the economy, uh, but it will have impact on how uh, international taxation rules work and how multinational companies are taxed, including in the mining sector. Other types of reactions that we're also starting to see 
there could be a renewed interest in production chain contracts for mining, which typically hasn't been uh, a type of contracts used in the mining sector, uh, more, more frequent in oil. But some of the factors that have played in favor of PSCs in the oil sector may actually be coming to mining. Think about you know, more remote operations with fewer workers, maybe fewer domestic workers, um, highly complex technological operations that uh, can be more, uh, more easily um, isolated um, from, the, from the rest of the, of the economy. That has been a factor into the adoption of PSCs in the, in the oil sector. And some countries are already starting to, I think, including Senegal, have actually um, starting to think through how, what could, look, what could PSCs in the mining sector could look like. Um, we could also see a renewed interest in state participation. Um, and you know, this is already a trend we're seeing, for example, more recently in Papua New Guinea, uh, with added, um, ad added uh, equity in mining projects from, for, for, for governments. On the opposite end, the more complex business models might actually lead some countries to adopt more rudimentary revenue-based uh, fiscal instruments because they fear tax avoidance or they fear not getting enough taxes from employment. Um, for example, there's a debate now in Chile about creating a new mineral royalty. Um, that's quite, that's quite um, hotly debated. So lots of possible reactions from different governments on how, on, you know, depending on how the future evolves. And it's actually exciting for us to think to like, to, to try to develop, to, to look at how the field evolves and what the different, how the different how different countries adopt new different uh, policies to, to change the way they, they tax the mining sector. And so we've actually created a project jointly with the uh, African Tax Administration Forum to, to help gather some of these thoughts and, and discuss, with, discuss them with all stakeholders. It's called the future of resource taxation. And I can share a link in the, in the chat as well, but it's definitely linked to that reflection around um, the future of mining and the adoption of new technology. So we we'll stop here, and 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 I look forward to hearing um, what other panelists have to say and the rest of the discussion. Thank you. To my many thanks for that. Very very interesting. Of course, there's this uh, the complexity around it, but of course it has to it has a lot to do with the age old, uh, uh, indeed eternal question around labor and capital. Um, Hopewell, if I go to you for the initial question, what do you think are some of the implications around um, potential revenue streams? Tom, I just mentioned a little bit around. Chile considering a new um, a new tax. How do you see it from your side? Um, okay, thanks, Richard. I think um, what I'll do. Let me just uh, share part of uh, a presentation I've I've prepared. Uh, I think as uh, Isabel and uh, and Thomas uh, have already noted, uh, uh, the impact is uh, pretty difficult to measure. Uh, but what I can say is uh, the tax implications. Uh, pretty much hinge on government priorities and um, and how well the government is able to plan ahead. Uh, it's not going to be a one size fits all. Uh, but um, but I do think that uh, the tax to revenue ratio will be a key trigger uh, to the reactions uh, as noted by, by Thomas. Uh, it's the ultimate indicator, isn't it? Um, and let me elaborate on those points. Uh, if we simplify and, uh, and break down the, the taxes uh, into three categories. Uh, you've got the direct taxes, uh, the income taxes, which are pretty much based on employment, uh, and, um, and the indirect taxes. Now, if you take a scenario where uh, the government prioritizes uh, short-term cash and uh, predictable uh, revenues, uh, they may go for direct taxes. Uh, and in that instance, uh, taxes uh, pegged on revenues uh, will be a key lever. So um, we are talking like, um, um, taxes like uh, royalties. Uh, so the question is, uh, will we see fluctuations in, uh, in royalty rates? Now, new technology may also mean more profits for mining companies um, if they, they become more, more efficient. Uh, but the question has always been on, on taxable earnings. Uh, and in this respect, um, I understand the OECD is uh, leading the, the work on base erosion and uh, profit shifting. Uh, under the BEPS inclusive framework. Uh, minimum taxes have already been uh, proposed. Um, and um, and on, on that note, I think it's important for developing countries to, you know, to join these OECD platforms. Um, and then another scenario could be where the government simply prioritizes attracting foreign direct investment. Um, in that case, you may see technology incentives 
uh, in the form of uh, uh, tax incentives. And, um, and let, but let me say, um, if the projects are already viable, then uh, it, there's pretty much no need for to, to undertax uh, multinational companies. Uh, governments can also raise revenues through indirect taxes. So um, if you look at it, Richard, uh, new technology is going to be worth billions. Uh, and you can imagine that a small increase in, in VAT, for example, uh, could actually raise uh, a, a lot of revenues uh, for governments. But, but what we know, what we also know is that uh, whichever scenario, um, employment, uh, particularly for low skilled jobs will go down. Um, and that means uh, loss of income taxes. Uh, local procurement may also go down since developed countries may not have the capacity to, you know, to supply the high-tech equipment or spare parts or even services. So in a nutshell, uh, will new technology lead to an overall increase or decrease in national revenues? Uh, I'm sorry to think that, um, you know, different countries uh, will be affected in different ways. But my word of advice is, look, I used to work for corporate strategy for Arsenal Metal. And, um, we were involved in, 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 in all sorts of transactions uh, across all regions. But one thing that was particularly clear when we dealt with, uh, especially most of uh, developing countries, was the information gap. So, you know, deal making is complex, and I think governments really need to, um, at times, just seek uh, assistance, uh, especially where there's a skills gap. Uh, and I'm glad, like you mentioned, uh, Richard, that the Con Connect Support Unit uh, is filling that gap. Uh, and I think that's that's important because uh, for mining to be sustainable, uh, these needs to match shareholders' expectations uh, with host country, you know, uh, uh, government and, and community expectations as well. So in, 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 with regards fiscal revenues, I would say it's important for governments to do three things. First of all, uh, just cl clarify your priorities. And then secondly, uh, do plan ahead. Uh, you know, tax planning is crucial. Um, multinational companies like Anglo, there they do quite a lot of tax planning. So it's important that uh, on the other side, you know, governments uh, equally match uh, that firepower. And um, and, and uh, third, you know, by all means, you know, seek the negotiation support at an early stage uh, to 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 mitigate that information gap, which can translate into billions of uh, of dollars in lost uh, tax revenues. Uh, if that is not uh, 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 approached appropriately. Um, I think I'll stop here for now um, to just hear the, the, the view from um, the other colleagues, especially uh, Anglo, which is, which is here on the panel as well. Oh, well, thank you very, very much. Listen, what I thought I'd do uh, is introduce each of you along the way, but I think maybe I'll just get it out of the way. Um, just to let you know, Sam, you'll be on deck in just a moment. But just very quickly, uh, Hopewell Maui, is, he's a London-based strategy consultant, and he has pretty considerable experience advising governments, multinationals, um, policymakers, uh, and also public and private sector uh, participants. Um, he specializes in mining project evaluation, extractive sector fiscal revenue strategies, um, deal negotiation, uh, and a number of other areas. Previous posts, as he mentioned, uh, ArcelorMittal, but also he was at De Beers and Ernst & Young. Um, we're also joined by Viola Taras. Um, Viola is a uh, consultant for IGF. She's focusing on the future of resource taxation with Toma and her colleagues. She's previously worked for Oxfam in Kenya, as well as for the National Oil Company of Kenya as a petroleum economist. We're very pleased that Rosalind Carlos has been able to join us from Senegal. Rosalind is the Director of Mines and Geology at the Ministry of Mines and Geology in Senegal. She's also a geological engineer who's graduated from the Institute of Earth Sciences of the Sheikh Anta Diop University in Dakar. She holds a DESS in Mining, Environment and Safety from the Ecole des Mines de Alès in France. Finally, we have uh, two people from Anglo-American. Uh, first is Dave Murray. Dave is a tax policy uh, principal at Anglo-American. He leads the, the group's tax policy team. Before joining Anglo, he was at the uh, at PricewaterhouseCoopers as the international tax policy director. Um, and before that, he was looking at uh, EU and OECD tax policies at General Electric. 
Um, Dave has quite a lot of experience around domestic and international tax policy, and a particular interest in tax morality, transparency, and sustainability as well. Finally, we have uh, Samantha Thompson. Sam is currently head of uh, legal global mergers and acquisitions at Anglo-American, where she works closely with the government relations team on ethics, transparency, and accountability matters. Uh, her previous posts include also PwC in London. Um, she was laterally corporate, uh, she, uh, sorry, co-head of uh, corporate affairs, uh, responsible for regulation and also uh, reputation. She was previously based in Hong Kong for a decade where she was a corporate partner at Linklaters. Um, what I'd like to do, uh, now that I've introduced everybody, this is a quite an outstanding panel, what I'd like to do is, is keep it going. And so Sam, from your perspective, how do you see it um, from an M&A point of view uh, at Anglo and how you think of uh, resource taxation and the future of it? It's a, it's a really interesting and good question. So in my head, and if, from the M&A perspective, it's become more and more important. And I've seen the evolution of decision-making in M&A go from purely fundamentals-based, i.e. revenue-based, to much more aligned with impact decision-making when you are looking at M&A. So looking at the whole ESG type considerations, factoring those into your M&A decisions, but also looking at different types of assets and things that would go into your portfolio. And I, I don't think this is something that is idiosyncratic to mining. I think in multiple sectors, people have got to look at M&A in a different way because of the evolution of those sectors, the evolution of societal demands. So what are going to be, for example, in you know, the metals, minerals, materials of the future, and also the technological development. So what are the techno technologies of the future? Can we develop them internally? Do we have to buy them in? Do we have to license particular products? So I think M&A is, is, is a really interesting area to be in at the moment because the mentality around M&A strategy, I think, is evolving because of these technological um, changes and societal developments. Not only that, I mean, you, 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 you touch on the kind of the resource nationalism and the, the, the broader political and geopolitical uh, issues that go on. We have to factor those in too. And, and with COVID, you've seen policies can change and, and countries can change what they're doing very, very quickly. So, for example, if, if, you're, um, if there was another crisis, for example, and you were in a sector that had received lots of bailout money, potentially you're not going to be able to spend on what you thought you were going to be able to spend on. So you've got to change your capital allocation policies as well. So I think there's, there's an awful lot to it. I think the other key thing, and I know we'll, we'll probably get to it later, is that if you're looking at technology plays and technology evolution, the cultural piece is so important. So the social piece and, and you know, in the mining sector, factoring in people, factoring it being guided by our purpose. So Anglo-Americans purpose is to reimagine mining to improve people's lives. Having that at the forefront of the decisions we make is, is really, really important. So, it, you know, from that perspective, I think um, you know, the sector does potentially have some different lenses looking at M&A and looking at tech because the societal piece is so important. Great, thanks very, very much. Uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to ask uh, Rosalind, um, from her perspective, a lot of it, in my own experience, many, many large multinational companies will simply come into countries and this element of, um, of involving not only citizens, but of course the government and helping, helping them understand what exactly they're, they're trying to do, what the goals are, so to speak, and how, um, yeah, as Sam just mentioned, this, this cultural piece, uh, Rosalind, from your perspective, how would you, or would you, would you look at the role of governments as citizens as essentially um, receivers of this, uh, of technology, or is there an element, is there a real possibility with regards to engagement as far as, you know, helping have, helping create a dialogue instead of just, here comes a company, the company will implement something, uh, it might be new technology, it might be a new process, 
Um, how do you see from from the government of Senegal from the government of Senegal's point of view how um, essentially how can the government play a play a, a key role an active role at the end of the day it's it's your asset um, and also citizens for that matter. Merci beaucoup, Cher. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to join you today in this panel. I'm taking this opportunity to thank uh, all the partners from the Senegal government such as IGF and Connex. So you we've ha have um, initiated a, a wide number of activities and hopefully we will be able to strengthen the position of the government in the negotiation process for some mining contracts. So on this topic, Senegal, like other mining countries which have more or less the same profiles as Senegal, uh, the policy or strategy for social and economic development is partially based on the development of the mining sector. Why? Because the mining capacity to attract direct foreign investment and employment and also to uh, allow the private sector to thrive and move forward so for the specific issues the main question is does new technologies and innovations that have been boosted uh, for the after uh, due to COVID-19 which really shifted our paradigm and it has somewhat allowed some technologies to uh, be further promoted so it has been game changing. It has dramatically changed our habits. So as governments, how can we, how can we, how can we have a, a sort of innovative um, regulatory um, measures? How can we take all those changes into account? How can we embrace them? Um, and this, is this legal framework well implemented? So I want to go back to, uh, to some, on some innovations in the mining sector and those innovations helped us sort out three major aspects which are part of the aims that, that focus on mining resources. So first of all, we need to supply, provide employment. In Africa, we have a very young population and they're, willing to find employment and the direct revenues uh, to the state from mining operations and you know the latest IT report for the year 2019 has shown that the mining sector and the extraction sector has provided about 40 percent of export profits uh, five percent in the GDP but it's quite low for the contribution to employment. The third point is about strengthening the uh, private sector involvement in the uh, supply chain of the mining sector. Um, just to pick up with what Isabel said, we don't have much visibility over the future. So will those new trends have an impact on the aspects that I've just mentioned? I mean, employment, employability, and direct revenues, which are expected by the state of Senegal. I'm, I'm talking about the direct or indirect contributions, but above all, will the national private sector be able to join this? Uh, if we increase more technology, if we adopt more technologies, will the national private sector uh, join this supply chain? I think these are key questions that deserve to be addressed. Think about Senegal, for instance. Um, so as far as employment is concerned, employment team has been that we have to start from to reinforce endogenous uh, development by uh, focusing on education and young people training. If our governments do not have the right tools, if they're not 
uh, well equipped to promote and um, how to say um, foster um, education and help young people uh, get new skills and as a result if they don't do that there will be a reduction in employment is it reality or should we move towards new trends or new jobs i'm sure we have lots of opportunities ahead of us because senegal has a good uh, connection at national and international plan because the digital world is a basis for development for the new technologies so as far as employment is concerned um for the uh currently applicable uh, mining code of 2016 for the companies that are established in senegal there should be uh, some preference for local labor so it's about offering preference for the national goods and services that are uh, produced locally so those issues have already been accounted for so, but is this enough should we go further should we go beyond this so i guess those questions will deserve a lot more food for thought and some surveys will be uh, um, performed outside and elsewhere by igf through eisd um uh, from and uh, some direct revenues are expected you know we've been talking about taxes are in the mining sector but also uh, common rights uh, taxations for the mining taxation what is it all about it's about the duties and taxes it's about the mining taxes it's about the superficial taxes but also other types of revenues that may be expected because a new mechanism has been introduced in the 2016 code uh, we call it the uh, production sharing contracts. These are innovations that were introduced by Senegal in the 2016 code in order to allow the state to become um, a, full, a fully fledged operator in promoted areas. Then the state will be able to draw service contracts with uh, national investors or with international investors. They the revenues connection i've missed one point for the mining tax the idea is about uh boosting the local processing of mining products what we realize when you look at the figures for exports well all the products are exported uh, if we manage to have a local industry to boost uh, the value chain of re mining resources, we will be able to provide more uh, foster research. In this regard, modulated a modulated taxation system has been introduced in the 2016 code. So the more we produce, the less taxed they are in terms of a mining taxation for ore or gold, it is taxed at 5% of the selling value uh, for the in terms of mining tax. So when it's refined in Senegal, it's 1.5% taxation. So the, the, we want to encourage the local processing. And this is a uh, regulation that's already in place so as far as participation is, in, is is concerned we really want to boost the involvement of the state in mining in the mining industry so 10 percent of uh, of the shares of the operating companies should be allocated for free to the state uh, for free i mean in inverted commas but the mining code also offers the opportunity to uh join the capital of the mining companies and that's for the private sector and the state and it can go up to 25 percent so in that regard in order to strengthen its position and better control the governance of the mining companies in which the state is a shareholder they have set up a reform an institutional reform by creating 
the company of uh, the um, mines in Senegal, it was set up in 2020. So the goal of this company is to manage the assets of the state within the mining companies and reinforce those assets by using the opportunities which are um, offered by the mining code. So the, the question comes back again, is this enough? Is this enough? Because if you look at the agreements that we sign with the companies that are uh, performing research or operations, incentives are allocated to those companies such as tax reliefs or uh, customs uh, relief. If these innovations can boost profits made in uh, mining, so the fundamental question we may ask is, Will this be relevant to allocate the same type of incentives in terms of taxation to the companies? Do they need them? But this depends on the technologies that are covered. So there are many pending questions that we have to address and we do not necessarily have the answers today of course, there's a regulatory aspect and the political aspects that need to be accounted for, but the control aspects also have to be addressed. And the opportunities used by mining companies could actually reinforce their profits. And, but this could also be used by the states to reinforce the control mechanisms that we have. As Thomas said, the tax administration uh, working with the mining um, industry, while well, they're both studying the implementation of a follow-up system for mining operations that would allow the state to find new niches to reinforce the contribution of the sector in the economy. So this those new technologies could be used in the projects that we have, such as the paperless um, systems or the implementation of uh, platforms for the follow-up of um, uh, mining operations. A wide series of tools could be developed to adapt to the new existing technologies. We could uh, help modernize the mining administration. So this is my global uh, approach, just to show you that we are uh, we are well aware of those growing trends and their impact on the legal frameworks and policies of the developing countries, but also their impact in real life and in the monitoring and control practices that we have to adapt because there's been uh, um, ongoing evolution. This is what I wanted to say. So I will be very happy to answer your questions. From an Anglo point of view, what would you expect with regards to technology? How would that, should we say, make it easier for you, um, both not only for yourself as a company, but also, frankly, your relationship with the government over, you know, over the coming generation? Thanks, Richard, and, uh, and good afternoon, good evening, good, good morning, everyone. Um, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll start with just a, a couple of reflections on, on what's been said already that will probably give a little bit more context to, to, to my comments on, on incentives. Um, you know, te technology and new systems is not something that we, we choose to invest in, it's something we have to invest in. Uh, and society and all our stakeholders have expectations about safety and sustainability, and we have to respond to those concerns in order to remain competitive. Uh, and I think it does pose big questions about tax and tax incentives, socioeconomic uh, contributions, legal, regulatory, all the things we're talking about today. Uh, and uh, when, when Thomas was, was saying earlier that, um, you know, that they, they didn't have all the answers, uh, I'm afraid I'll, I'll probably just point, I don't have all the answers either. Um, but I do think that one thing the IGF project does really well uh, and, and has done you know, even from an early stage when they were scoping it last year, was they're looking at the right questions. And I think these are the types of questions, even though we don't have you know, easy answers to all of them, and a lot of the 
even where we do have some detail, it might be quite specific uh, in for, for specific circumstances and specific investments. Um, I think they are the right questions to be asking. So it's great that we are having this conversation and we're really pleased to, to be part of it. Um, I think the tax challenges specifically that, that follow from, from digitalization and, and technology, and, and certainly there, there are tax challenges, they're not dissimilar to the other type of challenges. Um, you know, the existing tax rules mandate how much tax we have to pay and how much other stakeholders have to pay. And, and we're very clear in our strategy that we comply with those with the, the rules uh, of the countries we operate in. Uh, and we're also very clear around what we will do about incentives. Uh, we will only undertake incentives if we uh, accept incentives if we believe that they're sustainable uh, uh, and that they are you know, based on a true legislative basis, uh, that they are uh, above board and that they're in the interests of the sustainability of our investment, of us and the host nation that we're working with. Um, I mean, but all business change will lead to changes in the amount of different taxes paid based on where those businesses create value, how they create value, where the suppliers are located, where the customers are located. In, in our sector, for things like volume of production, quality of production, the life of the mine, all of these factors will impact the amount of tax that, that we pay um, around the world or in individual countries. Uh, and changes in our business and changes in technology and changes in society um, will impact the, um, the amount of tax that, that is paid. Um, I think what is interesting really, the, the bigger question here, is that while some taxes might increase and others decrease, what's the overall fiscal yield to the government on projects? You know, what, what, when you look at the whole life of the mine, the quality of the output, all of the other additional factors, and Thomas mentioned things like um, the impact on uh, local community spending, um, it, over the whole life of that mine, what is the overall impact on the government? Um, because there's a difference between talking about the impacts of tax bases and tax trends and tax incentives. Um, you know, we can probably talk about that as a group of tax experts in a closed forum, but really looking at you know, whether that gives different stakeholders the right economic outcome in the round is not a conversation that can take place in a vacuum because tax changes do impact tax uh, behavior. They can distort business decisions. Um, and I think of all of the, um, of all of the areas that the IGF paper touches on, uh, so changing business models, uh, the changing role of, uh, of employment and employment taxes uh, and intangibles. I think the one that aligns most with the incentives question is around uh, intangibles. And I think it's right to be looking at this. So um, for example, um, you know, we've already seen in other sectors, we're seeing more and more in mining, intangible assets make up an increasing share of total enterprise value. And, and absent any tax planning, intangible assets are a source of considerable value, but they are very hard to value. They're hard to audit. Uh, they, they can result in concentrations of taxable profits in, in, in different locations to, to where they might have been previously. Um, and under the existing international tax framework, we have to look at the functions and assets and risks and where they're located and where they're managed and try and allocate the profits accordingly. And it's not an easy thing to do. Um, and so while, while some countries might see some of those allocation of profits to somewhere else as, as value stripping and, and base erosion, particularly if it's a payment for use of technology that is um, you know, simultaneously impacting uh, the, the, the operations of the activities in the country in terms of the, 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 the roles and uh, the jobs uh, and, the, uh, uh, and the piece around community investment. You know, it's not all one-way traffic. It might be transfers of value from resource-rich countries to the head office, but it might be transfers of value between resource-rich countries to reflect where technologies have been developed and tested to other resource-rich countries. So I think it is important to see there's an opportunity here as, as well. Um, you know, the, in, it, it, you try and deal with these problems with things like withholding taxes or refusing deductions for payments on intangibles um, or not trying to incentivize uh, investment in the right areas. All that's really doing is creating double taxation and making it more expensive to develop and utilize the technology that's critical for the successfulness of, of the mine itself. The much bigger price here is to make sure that the technology is well used, that it's not viewed in isolation, and that the uh, businesses are incentivized to develop those technologies um, and you know, test those technologies and work with uh, the technologies and local suppliers and local government in the countries where they're going to be used. 
Great, Dave. Thanks very much. That's of course interesting with regards to the to the incentives. And I guess if I if I hand it over your to your colleague, um, Sam, what do you what are from a from a regulatory perspective? What do you think are some of the some of the challenges there? I think sometimes the regulators can be behind the pace of change and aren't necessarily the most well informed as to what the latest technology is or the trends in, in, in where technology is going. So you find that the regulations are sort of regulating for technology slightly yesterday instead of technology five years ahead. So I think it's really important that jurisdictions, I don't know, businesses, governments learn from other jurisdictions which may be potentially ahead or other sectors that may be ahead and may have faced similar challenges. So some technological challenges that will and do appear in the mining sector will be very similar to other in other sectors so cyber security things like ethics and trust looking at how blockchain is regulated because it will be relevant to the sector looking at um, you know climate friendly technologies and how those are regulated and how those are implemented so I think it's it's important for regulators to try and, and be a bit more broad minded, but have those dialogues with businesses, learn from each other. And we're very much a sort of, we've got to listen as a business, we've got to collaborate with others, we've got to learn so that any policies we develop internally are relevant for the future. But I think that equally applies to the regulatory environment as well. I think you're absolutely right. It's not only in resource rich countries, I look at my own country and the um, yeah, let's just say that the, the that the U.S. Congress and other legislative bodies are significantly behind the curve with regards to technology. Uh, significant is an understatement. Um, if I hand it over, Hope, I'll just just from your perspective, we, if we take something very very specific, um, should imported technology uh, pass through customs? Should there be is that is that a potential revenue stream um, for the future? Well, I, I think that's a, uh, that's a good question. Um, we've actually looked at um, a lot of the impacts uh, that could come uh, as a result of the, 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 the changes in, in technology. Uh, let me just broadcast again part of my uh, presentation. So we looked at um, uh, what would be the impact in terms of uh, new technologies and what sort of tax considerations uh, could come in. And uh, I think you're right. Uh, there's a whole lot of a legal minefield for, for new technology and, uh, uh, and of course, lots of unanswered questions. And, but the thing is, new technology is, uh, is changing fast. I think uh, Sam has already mentioned that. And uh, World Trade Organization rules uh, may be slow to catch up, uh, which leaves room for individual discretion. But I would like to rephrase the question and, uh, and really push back to the developing countries. And I think Rosalind was actually on point uh, on, on most of it. Uh, look, technology, it takes a great deal of resources and, uh, and effort to develop. So surely there must be some sort of incentive for, for innovation. And um, to that extent, I think my view is the developing countries need to look beyond uh, just direct revenues from mining. Uh, they need to consider diversification uh, to other forms of revenue streams. So uh, that could come in terms of in, investing in, in, in public goods like uh, education, uh, skills development, um, and, and infrastructure. Uh, and as we have had, uh, especially from the uh, IEGF uh, guys, that uh, uh, you know the technology, it may alter the business models. So Imagine a situation where the mining profit pool shifts to technology providers. And if you rely on natural resources, issues like resource nationalism, um, uh, social license to operate and good governance, I think they will, they will feature more prominently uh, more and more again. So um, I'm afraid it's, it, it's going to take uh, a bit of some diligent fiscal and macro planning. Uh, investing in education, seeking innovation partnerships with these multinational companies, uh, perhaps doing so um, uh, in collaboration with local universities. Um, but uh, I, I think what needs to happen is, is really to grow the tech base 
And uh, this is really what successful resource rich company, uh, uh, countries have done. Um, and I think it would be imprudent to, to just uh, hit on uh, uh, knee jerk uh, rises to, to taxes in one form or the other. Like um, I, I have had uh, issues on uh, say three percent, three ten percent uh, equity stack. I think you know mining companies could interpret it as a form of taxation. You know, if you're giving away, um, um, uh, you know, revenues uh, uh, for free uh, in courts. So, um, and I think uh, you know, mining is uh, is the goose that lays the the golden egg, and uh, uh, it's in everyone's interest to to make it sustainable. And um, one way to make it sustainable is just to make sure that uh, um, uh, there the, the, the is balance uh, from both sides on the multinationals, but also uh, uh, a considered, uh, you know, uh, taxes from, from the government and, and community side as well. Great, many thanks for that. I uh, hope well. And Rosalind, if I could, if I could ask you, um, just over the last, uh, Sam, Dave, and also Hopewell, they mentioned this discussion around, um, yeah, I guess the, the implicit was the, the aspect of dialogue between uh, governments and companies. I mean, from the, from the Senegalese government point of view, is there, is there some type of form, I realize that, that, that uh, Senegal is a member of the EITI, is there some type of, um, shall we say, yeah, good. Obviously, there's uh, cordial relations, etc. But is is there some type of forum in Dakar or in the country that really looks at some of these aspects that may involve others? For example, Parliament. Um, is there anything like that? Could you briefly could you briefly let us know if there's anything along those lines? Bon, euh, j'ai pas en tête un organisme formel. Well, there's no really formal organization that looks at this in Senegal, but it's, uh, it's quite clear that, uh, that through the framework that we have already, of course, uh, and the ITIs or all the, the partnership committees that our ministries have set up uh, with the uh, companies who work in, uh, within Senegal in the various set sectors, uh, such as phosphate or gold, for example, we, can, we do uh, have cordial relations with them and we do uh, discuss matters with them with regard to the objectives that our government um, has defined for this sector in terms of, of re results that we would like to achieve in the short and midterm. And, uh, and what I wanted to add is that within, regarding employment, for example, uh, what we should have a situ the situation we should have is that w is that we should be able to think together uh, about how uh, employment can be developed uh, and uh, and whether the technology that's that's being made available that's being pumped in is going to really have an, an effect on on employment and then and and if it's not then perhaps the the emphasis should be shifted the direction should be shifted somewhat despite the fact of course that that, uh, that uh, any time a uh, technological uh, a change comes in, uh, procedures change, protocols change, for example, then, it, then they have to, these comp companies have to inform the ministry of this. Uh, and uh, so, so we have to be able to, if we do identify problems in this area, then we can explore what those problems are together and decide what we're going to do. But, but the question of employment is a very sensitive issue, as you rightly said. The question of the 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 revenue that the that the government expects from the mining sector, it is a priority for us in Senegal because it contributes considerably to our uh, overall uh, uh, production per year, but. But should that perhaps be not be some sort of compensatory tax um, uh, for uh, the loss of employment that a technological uh, 
uh, advance would generate perhaps uh, maybe we could think of that uh, um uh, which uh, it, it, that that would mean that if there were to be this sort of compensatory tax tax arrangement it might encourage companies to actually think how otherwise about how their technology they would implement these new technological advances anyway so so we, we have to define these things of course we have and clearly we have to work together to to be able to do this and so we have to make sure that the that the, the benefits uh, that come from the mining sector are of course beneficial for for everybody throughout the country so Formally, we don't have an organization as such that looks into these issues that David was the, that uh, Risha was talking about. But the system which exists at present in, in Senegal does, in fact, de facto do this because it, it, it serves this purpose. Because, in fact, uh, uh, but of course, some things can have to be adapted, and because there's always scope for adaptation and. Uh, and I think we should uh, we should have have an have take an avant-gardist view to this. We must be forward-looking. It's not easy, and I think the questions that apply, the, the situation that we have in Senegal is very very similar to other that in other countries. Uh, uh, but having said that, I think we can we can all move forward by by discussing these issues together and uh, and uh, and making progress in this way. Many thanks. Mm. Uh, uh, merci, Rosalind. Here for the initial for the initial part, but um, I'd be grateful if you could let us know a little bit. How's if you look at the resource of taxation project? How has your you, the work that's been established over the last six or eight months? How has that? It was obviously written in the time of COVID. Has there been any broader reflection with regards to how technology? You know, you look at how the pandemic really focused technology, not only, um, shall we say, with regards to, shall we say, the, the development of a, of a vaccine, but also the impact, um, not only in health, but also, for example, in education. From your perspective, do you see the technology and its potential rollout in mining having a, a, a multiplier effect in other, in other sectors in some resource-rich countries? Thank you so much, Richard. And I'm sorry, I'm joining late. I'm stepping in for my colleague, Toma, who had to run in for another engagement. No problem. Good. Um, so yeah, technology and COVID. Um, I think when COVID happened, we got to see that um, sectors that were automated or more into automation were able to be spared a bit, that they were able to continue their operations. But then we could also see that sectors, including mining, where they were highly dependent on employees to um, function or to operate the mine sites, we saw how they were affected and what it meant that they had to stop operation, they had to partially close. But then on the other hand, we saw the backlash from the communities, we saw the backlash from the employees who said, we need this job. So we need to be employed because then that provides for our communities. So it showed the it showed it showed both sides. It showed the reliance um, to the in, into the reliance of um, employees and also what employees rely to get out of the mining and provision of employment. But then also you look at the education sectors and some of the countries like Kenya, we saw schools being closed um, and learning because then we are not at that level when learning is able to take place because of technology online. We saw students losing out a lot. We saw same thing happening to hospitals that now because of not automation, not able to access your doctors online. So I think right now, um, a lot of sectors, including the mining sector, are acknowledging that technology, the role of technology um, within the different sectors. And I think right now, I think it will be a lot of discussion and a lot of balance between um, the aspect where automation is going to increase, um, is going to decrease employment into some of these sectors, but at the same time, it's also going to increase um, efficiencies and be able to sort of come in when um, such learnings or such um, presence, physical presence is not really required. So I think that there, there has to be an important um, conversation that has to take place between all the stakeholders involved. Viola, thanks very, very much. Uh, what I'd like to do, we have we have a couple of questions um, to to Sam and Dave. Do you uh, could you speak a little bit around partnerships? Do you do you foresee some of the changes in partnerships um, or through vertical vertical in integration where tech companies or end users, for example, battery uh, battery companies, might take bigger stakes in the industry itself? Uh, 
alongside you, of course. <laughs> I think that question is, is relevant to many sectors at the moment, and it's certainly something that we can't ignore. Yes, the sector is going to evolve. There will be different players and there will do, be different partners. I can't tell you who they will be and, and exactly what they'll be doing, but keeping aware of those so-called new kids on the block is something that we're very conscious of because the sector will change as societal demands change. I'm sure you'd be looking at it from the M&A point of view, of course. <laughs> uh, Dave, any comment from your side? No, I think I, I mean, I'd, I'd agree with, with, with what Sam has said. We've, we've seen it in, in, in other industries and, and it's true with so many of these, um, so many of these technological uh, challenges, this isn't happening to our sector in a vacuum. And we do have at least the benefit of having seen similar things happen in other sectors before so that we, can have discussions like this uh, and internally and, and in our own lives to, to think about the impact and, and try and prepare for it in, in a way that others may not be able to do. Thanks for the question, Isabella. That was a great one. Um, if there's another, there's an, another question as well from Odesu Olenia. Uh, technological advances and digital transformations have their merits but can we now start to envisage the challenges of more economic losses in countries with little technological know-how? What do the panelists think about this? Well, I think uh, it, it brings the, you know, the, the, the question of diversification. Um, and uh, I mean, to the extent that the, the resource rich uh, countries are going to feel that uh, most of the uh, benefits uh, are going to, uh, external, you know, that may bring in a couple of issues. So I think the onus is on uh, the multinational companies themselves um, to try and, uh, and harness and nature uh, the local skills, uh, local talent, so that they impact on, uh, on, on employment, uh, at least, uh, you know, can be reduced. But for that to work, they have to work with the governments and it, you see, they can only work with what they have. So that means the government has to direct most of its um, um, uh, uh, revenues uh, to, to a big extent as well to, um, uh, to, 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 to education and, and, and skill development, skills development. So it, it's going to have to work in partnership. Great, thanks very much, Havo. There's also a question from Jerry Ahadi, Ahadije. Uh, actually, I guess it's specifically to you, but I'd be grateful if, if others could comment as well. So the tech environment is changing very fast. How can governments be supported to review their policy and regulatory frameworks and train staff to catch up? Topol, do you want to jump in briefly and then I'll open it up? Well, I, I think you see the, I, I think, uh, let's go back to the World Trade Organization. I think the World Trade Organization um, is going to be critical in this respect uh, to the extent that they define uh, what can be text and uh, what cannot be text. Um, and if you follow the conversations at the moment, digital text, uh, it's affecting all countries, whether it's developed countries or, or, or developing countries. Um, and I think it's important to, to be on the platforms. So, you know, for, for developing countries, it's important to, to join um, uh, platforms where this is discussed, like uh, the OECD, and, uh, and really come up because it's, it's, no one really knows uh, uh, the answers at the moment. So these, these things are being discussed. So it's better for them to be discussed when you're on the trap table. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. There are there are a number of fora, both uh, yeah, I guess you'd say regionally and also internationally, where I think it's important. This idea, if you're not at the table, you're simply not. Your issue will not be raised. That is clear, um, and I think that's particularly important so that everybody sees, shall we say, with eyes wide open, what what are some of the the policy implications, frankly, tax implications, in the coming years um, for countries. Just very quickly on your point about capacity. Um, Capacity is, is definitely uh, a challenge. Uh, there's a, there are a number of good financial governance programs. I would just say from my own, um, from some of my own experience, uh, there are some contracts or some projects that are so complex that many countries uh, essentially take external parties um, to negotiate on their behalf. Um, just a, a very quick example, Berlin had a 
nice, gorgeous new airport. It's taken 15 plus years and been very painful in its implementation. And it was all done by the German government. Um, so in that sense, that's quite a big learning. What could have been, what could have been prevented or, um, or as far as time reduce, uh, also frankly, the reduction in, uh, in the spend um, if an external specialized firm was brought in. So that's maybe something that, uh, that others should, should think about as well. Um, if I, uh, I want to speak, I want to touch a little bit more uh, with regards to, uh, with regards to this, the cultural angle. Um, do you, Rosalind, from, from your point of view, when you are, um, when you're negotiating uh, with uh, international investors, do you find that there is sometimes elements of things that are lost in translation or uh, do you, for the most part, understand from, shall we say, a, a cultural point of view and also language point of view um, about how the, the approach of the firms that you're negotiating with? Rosalind, did you get that? Excusez-moi, malheureusement, j'ai très mal compris. Sorry, I could not understand. Could you repeat your question, please? Do that. So in short, I'm wondering from if, if I touch on this element of culture, when, when you do have negotiations, is there, just very briefly, is there, do you, do you feel like there is a, a common understanding with regards to, uh, with regards to the, the company um, or the firm that you're negotiating with? Is this element of, shall we say, a, a firm that maybe concentrates quite a lot on technology, where technology is part of the offer, and the government perhaps doesn't understand as much uh, about the role of technology in the project. Donc, uh, j'espère que j'ai très bien compris la question. Ben, je vais essayer de répondre. Si jamais ce n'est pas la bonne orientation, vous allez me recadrer, s'il vous plaît. Donc, uh, en matière de négociation, I mean, I don't ask toutes les well, uh, thématiques sont abordées, so notamment au plan technique, quelles so sont les technologies qui sont... Qui sont technical aspects address technology uh, that was not necessarily suitable for the state especially for employment you know I always talk about employment but this is a major challenge for us so let's assume that we use uh, belt conveyors between it and the extraction site and the processing plant, uh, let's assume that we have to make a choice uh, between the use of belt conveyors or a truck to carry and transport the, the ore from point A to point B. So we may have to make a choice or questions to ask uh, when comparing the impact and looking into the environmental impact because obviously this aspect has to be accounted for and we have to look into the social aspects also so the employment which will be pro provided will, will it make up for it's not comparable but the will it make up for the environmental impact if or if we use another technology will this would there be an impact on the environment? So we always have to face this sort of dilemma. So we have to find a trade-off between the technology that is used and the expectations of the state to, to see all the opportunities. Uh, and of course, we expect to gain an added value and benefits and profits for the local people and the state in general. So those questions may lead to some misunderstandings because obviously the company expects some efficacy and optimization and so on. But the government is more sustainability oriented they, to see how the uh, activity could be profitable and beneficial for the local people. So there's always a sort of compensatory compensation effect due to the loss induced by uh, selected technology and the impact that is expected uh, by the government. So we often have discussions with companies about the technological choices that have to be made. I hope I've understood your question. Yes. 
because I, 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 you were talking about the cultural aspects also. Valid point. This idea of, of course, the company has a certain frame of mind when it goes into um, when it goes into a project, and of course, from the other from the other side of the table, you have the government. Of course, they have something uh, priority as well. And so, I think it's important this idea of, shall we say, understanding the other and having. Uh, I think empathy is a very um, plays a very very important role, particularly when you're trying to develop a relationship for um, a generation or even two. Um, we have we have just a very short amount of time, and we have one question um, from uh, Ramina, from Ramina, and I guess this would this would largely go to um, to Anglo to the private sector, um, but anybody jump in. So maybe uh, you know a quick thirty seconds uh, or a minute or so from others. So here we go. Can the transition, excuse me, can this transition to to new technologies? be pushed by CSR actions from the mining companies, for example, through hackathons or workshops for local communities. Um, I guess I'm, I'm pointing to a certain Sam and Dave uh, on that one, but of course I'm, I'm keen for others to jump in as well. Just quickly on that one, I, I would say yes. What the appropriate way to do that will differ in different communities, different situations, but totally you know, the collaborative regional development the investing in the future, the talking to communities, the figuring out, working together when it comes to new technologies and new ways of doing business. It's all part of the, you know, our collaborative regional development approach, our sustainable mining plan. And exactly, uh, I think it's, it's key that there is that type of engagement. The exact, whether it's a hackathon or something else, I'm not sure, but that dialogue and that engagement has to happen. Dave, Dave, from your side, or or, or you yeah, think Sam? Uh... I, I, I mean, again, I, I find myself agreeing with, with with Sam. I think there is a responsibility for for, for businesses to to be getting involved in, in in the skills gap, not just in 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 the countries we operate in, not just in um, you know in in relation to mining, but but more broadly, the there is a, a skills gap globally um, that, that that needs to be filled, and 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 we need to play our part in that, uh, whatever that might look like. Right. Well, I, I think from my end, I'll just add that, um, uh, you know, mining companies already allocate uh, a, set, a fair share amount of their budgets into corporate social responsibility. So if it's going to come at an extra cost to what they are already doing, uh, that may um, not be practical in as much as we, we want it to happen. So um, it, it, it's, it's striking the balance. I think the government will have to play a big part in this and really take its uh, uh, responsibility in terms of uh, uh, good governance and uh, uh, distributing wealth uh, across, uh, every, not just in the local communities, but across the whole platform uh, equally. So that, that I think is going to uh, uh, play a more uh, uh, prominent role, obviously, as we, as we get into this. Okay. Oh. Sur cette question, Richard, je sais pas si je pouvais interpréter. Richard, can I say something about this? Yes, I think that for the issue of RSC uh, or CSR, uh, how could you use it in new technologies? First of all, I think it is important to perform an evaluation. So in all of our countries, we've had uh, involvements from mining companies in uh, corporate social responsibility. So what were the goals? What goals were achieved? What was done? What, what, what achievements have we made thanks to the implementation of CSR policies? Well, with the introduction of new technologies on how to improve the action of mining companies in communities, I think this should first start with a need, a need should be well identified and framed because the populations are not necessarily aware of these new trends. The thanks to the support of governments, maybe we should uh, reorganize the actions that are eligible for uh, CSR policies. And this is to, this aims at serving communities so we could sort of develop a resilience fund 
which is dedicated to the reinforcement of the capacities of the local people who live uh, near the mining companies. They should be for the people in general and the communities in general. I think that's definitely a, a major point and that's a very good one. So listen, we're, we're just running out of time. So um, I'd like to take this opportunity to, to thank everyone for joining us for today, today. For the government of Senegal, Rosalind, thank you very much for taking the time. I realize you're very busy. Your, your points are fantastic. And they really provided, um, yeah, I guess a, a window into what into what governments are thinking and some of the some of the challenges and also, frankly, some of the opportunities that are around. Um, to Sam and David Angler, thanks very much for your for bringing your expertise. Um, I hope well as well. Um, special thanks to Isabel and the IGF team. Um, there's a, a small army of people who made it possible. Toman Viola, uh, of course, but also David Perry, Ray, um, with regards to interpretation. And for the thought-provoking content and the you know the seamless logistics and technology, um, we hope that you found this webinar quite useful, um, enjoyed it, and also hopefully that you'll that you'll join us for the next one in early June um, to discuss the the community impact around technology. Um, from my side, I wish you health and safety in these challenging times, and um, wish you the best. Goodbye. Thank you for thank you for uh, spending time with us.